Um, so our session today is on digital media and society, shaping the future in a connected world. Uh, and just before we get started on the uh, topic of subjects, uh, we've shared a, a Google Doc in the uh, WhatsApp group, and we can reshare it again as well. And I believe it's also been shared in the chat here. Uh, and this is for uh, suggesting of speakers and topics for upcoming Diwans so that we can get your input and help uh, shape the direction that we want to take this. On the note of our topic today, uh, I'm sure many of you have seen the recent documentary, The Social Dilemma, uh, and have been thinking critically about how digital technology is either shaping or reshaping society. Whether it's contributing to political polarization, xenophobia, echo chambers, etc., changing our public discourse, uh, and even the way we, we, we go about cognition, uh, it's becoming more and more of an important issue. Uh, as part of Shark Diwan today, we are very excited to host uh, Mr. Riyad Minty. He leads uh, the digital team at TRT and is one of the founders of AJ+. Prior to that, he led social media at Al Jazeera Media Network, and today is one of the most prominent people shaping the digital media we engage with. Uh, just very briefly in terms of structure again, so the structure of the session will be a 30 to 35 minute talk by Mr. Riyad, followed by a Q&A and discussion that will take place over 30 to 40 minutes. So we're looking at a total of an hour to hour 20 minutes. For questions, uh, we ask that you either pose your questions in text format in the chat window, or if you have an intervention, and I would encourage this because it, it helps uh, further the discussion. If you have a direct intervention or question, you can use the raise, uh, raise hand uh, function in the application. Uh, I will get to you uh, in order and unmute you in accordance with the sequence so that you can engage directly with our speaker. Uh, and on that note, uh, Riyad, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, and I will pass the floor over to you. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me. Um, hi, everyone. Salam. Hope you're all doing well on this Thursday evening. Um, so the topic is quite a broad topic. And I think when I was talking to the CERC team about what exactly should be the topic of this, um, you know, there's different views in terms of where technology is leading us, um, some from optimistic, very optimistic about, you know, where we are at the world and how we're going to move to this decentralized, hyper-connected world that's going to be sort of the way in which we're going to be very connected to the very pessimistic. And I think Michael kind of touched on this when about the social dilemma. Um, I haven't watched it yet just because from what I've heard about it, um, it seems too depressing. Um, considering my job is in digital media, um, it might just be a bit too depressing in a pandemic to kind of have to um, go down that path. But I mean, the themes that that talks about and the dangers that kind of come up in this hyper-connected world are real and there's something for us to, to kind of um, be about and be aware of. Um, so usually, I mean, I'm used to talking to people and seeing people's faces and engaging. So this, I mean, obviously the Zoom world that we live in um, makes it a bit more complicated. And as Michael said, please feel free to post comments or if you want to have add anything to the conversation, just, you know, raise your hand and Michael can bring you into it. Um, I want to keep this conversation flowing. I want to keep it fluid. I want to um, explore these ideas with you because I don't think anyone really has uh, a concrete idea about how to shape the future. Um, and if anyone tells you they do, and they work in digital media, and they can tell you this is what's going to be happening in the next, you know, two, three years, um, they probably line, um, because it's absolutely incredibly difficult to have this sort of prediction. What we can do, though, is look at trends. And what we can do is you can look at where things are, and we can connect the trends to sort of how we function as humans, as humanity, and how we've historically functioned, um, and how technology is enabling us um, to do good or enabling us to do bad as we kind of move into this new space and how this hyper informed world and access that we have everywhere is shaping us. I also understand that the people watching, um, all of you come from diverse backgrounds, be it media, politics, students, um, activists. So I'm gonna try and keep the topics very um, general and broad um, to kind of cater for that. But I mean, if you have any specific questions about or interests in sort of your specific field that you specialize in, uh, feel free to ask it about that and we can kind of have a conversation around that space. Um, so I will start off just with a bit of background about myself and kind of where I'm at this moment in terms of sort of my work and sort of uh, where, we, where I'm focused. And then I'll get into sort of three areas of, you can call them challenges, or opportunities that we kind of face. Um, and just, you know, those three areas are sort of the echo chamber challenge or problem that we have and that we exist in at the moment, information overload, um, how much information is coming to us, um, and representation in media um, and how all of these kind of can come together to help us shape our future. 
Um, so by way of background, I think Michael, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm currently at TRT uh, or TRT as we say in Turkish. Um, I'm based in Istanbul. I've been here for the last four and a half years um, and I'm currently shaping sort of the digital strategy for the TRT network. Um, at the moment, I mean, I initially started off focused specifically on TRT World, which is the news channel, TRT Arabic, um, which is our Arabic channel. Um, and about two years ago, I shifted into a function to kind of look at the rest of the TRT network, which is made up of 14 channels um, and around 17 radio channels. Um, everything from children's content, drama shows. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the show Erturul. Um, that's a show that's produced by us. Um, we do a number of other drama shows. We have documentary channels. We have an art and culture channel. So I've been focused um, domestically, at least in terms of coming up with a digital strategy and how to position that but also how do we take this to international audiences? And I think with our show, Ertural, um, we've learned a lot in the space of kind of how people engage. Um, prior to that, I was at Al Jazeera uh, for 10 years. Um, at Al Jazeera, I was the head of social media and one of the co-founders of AJ Plus. Um, I joined Al Jazeera in 2006. Um, I was around, I guess, 21 at the time. Um, and I initially was hired to join the new media team. And the task of our team was to kind of understand the future of media, where things were heading to, and how could Al Jazeera as a media network keep up with those changes and come up with something? So a lot of the time when I talk, people are like, uh, well, I only want to talk about AJ Plus or Etrul. Those are the two things that do come up very often. But I, I mean, even at my time at Al Jazeera, AJ Plus, um, as great as it was, is off the back of a lot of hard work, understanding, which was almost you know, six years of working within the new media team as part of the social media team, understanding trends, understanding how these things were impacting us. Um, so that we could come up with a project like AJ Plus. So change and impact doesn't happen overnight. Um, as I've been at TRT now for four years and we only can, um, Edgerul was started being broadcast um, even before I joined. Um, and we've seen that global impact now. And I think one of the challenges we have in this world is we do look for immediate impact. We do something now and you want to see those tangible results. Um, but with, um, and I guess this hyper-connected world that we exist in makes us feel that we need to have these instant results. Um, but deeper change, deeper impact is, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes a lot of failures along the way to get there. Um, in terms of my, my focus, as I mentioned, I've been focused a lot more sort of internationalization of a lot of the TRT projects um, at the moment. And I shifted out of the new space about two years ago, and that was a very big eye opener for me in terms of moving out of news into more entertainment focused um, content. Um, and the I mean, I always thought the news world was a very big world and everyone's very connected in the news space. Um, but the second I stepped out into the entertainment world and just kind of looked at the actual impact we've seen um, through the show, um, it's absolutely phenomenal in terms of the, the reach and impact you have through the entertainment space. And largely a show like Etro has been able to relate and connect to people who ordinarily aren't represented in media and sort of through a higher quality production. Um, so we've seen there is a demand that exists out there within the space. Um, so that's just going to sort of frame my background and my thoughts um, to kind of center where I'm coming from to this conversation. Um, I understand everyone has a different background. As I said, everyone comes with a sort of a different take on this. So feel free to bring in your thoughts on that as we go through. So, you know, first up, I mentioned I'm going to talk about echo chambers. So echo chambers, it's nothing new. And I'm sure a lot of people may be familiar with the concept of echo chambers, but essentially it's the, we kind of, connect with people and ideas that echo our same worldview. Um, we do it in real life. I mean, you generally hang out with your friends or your family um, who kind of have the same view as you and you enjoy hanging out in their company and you'll discuss politics, you'll discuss life, you'll discuss sports, you'll discuss what shows you're watching. And there's a commonality that's there because that's that sort of echo chamber. And if you didn't have that commonality, you probably wouldn't be friends or hanging out in the first place. So we do work within our actual real world space like that. And that has been adapted into the digital space. Um, and the platforms that exist within there, um, I, mean, I think I mean, it's important for us to understand that we are the product um, of platforms like Facebook or YouTube. If you're using something for free, we are that product. Um, they are using it so they can sell advertising on top of us and it's a business that they're running. Um, it's not just, you know, as much people like to think it's for the greater good, maybe in the earlier days when it was a smaller platform, but at the scales at which they are at, um, it's a business for them. Um, and largely these platforms and the algorithms are developed over time. Um, and it's also based on our user input. So what you'll see is the pages that you like, the posts that you engage with, the people that you respond to, ultimately your feeds get shaped by this. Um, now the danger of this echo chamber for me is that it leads us towards a space where we have a very 
um, linear one-sided view of the world. And we think that this is how the world is functioning because these are the only ideas that we actually exposed to. And because we see it coming up so much in our social feeds, be it on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, wherever it is, we feel, oh, everyone's on the same path as me. Everyone's thinking the same as me, um, which is not really the case. Um, the platforms and algorithms, as I said, are designed to kind of shape that worldview. And it makes us feel happy that people are echoing and um, murdering kind of what we're saying. And that's kind of a space that we exist in. Um, so that's one of the dangers within sort of the echo chamber space. Now on the platform side, platforms have a very big challenge. Um, you know, do they want to be this promise space um, that's going to democratize information, democratize access? Um, you know, business models are very complicated for people to generate money within a digital space. You've seen subscription models coming up. Um, you know, a lot of your good content is now going behind a subscription model, which means not everyone is able to afford um, the content that they should be seen or would want to see. The stuff that's left for free is largely unchecked or unverified to an extent, um, which makes it difficult for us. So these platforms do have much bigger responsibility in how they actually come into the space, how they moderate and how they deal with things. But again, the challenge is a lot of these platforms come from a very Western perspective or a very specific perspective of how they, they view the world. And one of the examples I can give you is um, with the tragedy that we saw in Christchurch with the shooter. Um, if you were to go online on YouTube or Facebook and you search for that, you will not find any footage at all that exists of anything to do with that um, specific incident. Because as soon as it happened, yes, it was a terrible, um, tragic incident. Um, and all the social platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, decided that even if a news report had one second just showing the shooter even entering the mosque and even shooting, though it was completely pulled down and accounts, um, news reports even got blocked um, and got into trouble for this. But on the other side, if you have a case of someone who is necessary or who fits um, a sort of a Western view of what an attacker should be, you can find a lot of that content online. So the policies aren't actually being applied within a fair way or within a fair um, perspective in terms of sort of your background that comes in, um, which makes it a lot more dangerous for us in the world that we exist because you continuously seen a person committing a violent act who may look a certain way because it fits a specific stereotype that um, has largely been shaped over the last few years due to news, media, and where things are. But when you do see other spaces of that, there's no sort of alternate to kind of contrast that these are all um, sort of challenging spaces that we deal with. Um, and largely these platforms are making uh, life a lot more difficult for people to kind of engage within the space. Um, even when it comes to regulation, there's a lot of talk about should these platforms be regulated. Um, the question is who's going to regulate them? Um, you know, US companies will be regulated by the US, but again, there'll still be an element of foreign policy that will come into that. Um, for example, um, if you use Facebook today, you can't set Iran or Syria as your default country because of US sanctions on Iran. So that notion of democratization of freedom of information, freedom of access, freedom to voice your opinion is not there anymore. Um, and that becomes a challenge for us. Um, and so how do we get into a space of regulation? How do we get into more accountability for these platforms that they're actually being held to account for what they're putting out there and how they're engaging within the space? Um, that's an interesting area. And I think that's something that really needs to be focused on um, now to kind of get into that space. The second thing around echo chambers is there's also a lot of user error um, and a, a lack of knowledge. And that largely comes from us as users and end users. A lot of us don't realize that we exist within an echo chamber. Um, you know, the last US election, most people didn't expect Trump to win. Um, but if you went into Google search trends and looked at some sort of the discussions that are happening online, there was actually a lot of search interest in people interested in voting for Trump. Um, and if you actually looked at that data, uh, it would have given you a slightly different sense of the world versus what we would have seen within our own echo chambers. Um, so it gives us this false sense of surety. It gives us this false sense of, you know, what's really happening in the world. And the US election is coming up in a few days time. Um, you can see a lot of the echo chamber where the Trump supporters exist within their bubble and you know, the left exists within their bubble. There's people in the middle trying to critique both um, who tend to get blocked by both sides, um, which becomes a different challenge altogether. Um, and also, you know, it's, it is a concern for me and it's a concern I think as you move forward, if you want to move towards a world that has better understanding, that's better engaged, it's better informed, we also need to be willing sometimes to check our own biases at the door, know our positionality, know where we're coming from, know what our worldview is, um, but be willing to engage with what's happening online. And it's not just about going there for the sake of, I'm gonna go in and this person's an idiot and let me swear at them and, and kind of tell them why they're an idiot or engage with the trolls um, or people that we see as trolls who are actually, as it turns out, our voters um, and real people. So how do we break beyond our own echo chamber to actually get into a space to have conversations that need to happen? 
And until we're willing to kind of check ourselves as users to be able to make that step into that space, um, this, this continuous echo chamber problem is going to continue to exist as we kind of continually develop and move down um, the space. Um, second issue, um, information overload um, or challenge. So the, we have information like never before. Um, you know, we have YouTube, WhatsApp, Facebook, Netflix, um, TikTok, I don't know if you're on TikTok, Instagram, you know, at the touch of a button, we are always connected to everything at any moment in time. And that becomes an interesting challenge because we are never truly present in the moment. And I'm sure a lot of you who are watching this while you're watching this are busy doing something else, maybe catching up on some work, maybe studying, maybe writing a report, maybe sitting on WhatsApp, talking to friends, maybe playing a game on your phone. We are continuously multitasking. And as humans, there's only a certain amount of information points that we can actually take in and absorb to be truly present in a specific moment. Um, you know, one of the examples I like to, to use is WhatsApp, for example. Um, you might be having dinner with friends and you're having a very meaningful conversation in person, but at the same time, you're having three, four other conversations on your phone on WhatsApp. And while you're having one conversation, you're checking out, picking up your phone. And it's almost like the equivalent of getting up from the table in mid-conversation, going to have a conversation with someone else at another table, and then coming back in terms of your presence, in terms of your mind space, in terms of how you are centered in that space. And for me, that is a very big danger because we're continuously looking for this high of information or validation wherever someone says something in a group or something happens online, or I need to take a photo of um, you know, my food or where I am to kind of put it up online so I can get that like, so it can feed sort of um, my endorphins of kind of what I need. We're continuously living in this, the cycle of self-validation that we're looking for. Um, and that's taking us out of the moment and that's taking us out of the now, taking us out of where we are, taking us out of the, the real meaning that needs to happen. And I think that, you know, as we kind of go through this, um, we need to take a lot more ownership of our digital lives. We need to take a lot more ownership in how we actually choose to engage, how we curate, how we filter information. Um, you know, I try as much as I can to, within whichever platform I'm on, in terms of what I'm following is specifically for a specific need, um, or in some platforms I'm just used passively to kind of consume. Um, and so other platforms I just don't consume at all. I just use it so I can understand what's happening out there. Um, so we need to take a bit more effort in how we curate. Um, you know, even WhatsApp, everyone gets added to a thousand WhatsApp groups. Um, I try my hardest to leave most WhatsApp groups that I get added to randomly and try to kind of curate this is sort of what I need to be in for work, this is what I need to be in for family and everything else I would consider noise within a space um, if it's not really adding any value to my life or if it's giving me too much information that's going to overload me that I'm not able then to, to allocate my mind to something else um, that I feel I need to be more present in. So uh, as much as we like to opt in um, within digital platforms, I think we need to move towards an opt out culture. Um, where we do have the decision of whether we want to engage, whether we want to be on this platform, whether we want to be part of this conversation or not. Um, so to move in towards that sort of opt-out culture where we can kind of um, uh, choose the spaces that we want to be in. Um, so I think uh, this notion of escapism also exists within this information overload that sometimes you just feel truly overwhelmed. And I think the pandemic that's happening at the moment, um, especially in the earlier days when everyone was under lockdown, or we kind of moving into a new lockdown phase again in certain parts of the world. Um, you do sometimes just feel very overwhelmed with everything that's happening in life, um, even just looking at the news and where things are going, it can be incredibly overwhelming. So we want to have this escapism, we want to kind of sit back, switch on Netflix, um, and escape to another world for a period in time, so that we don't have to always be um, engaged with the right here right now and that's fine because we do need those breaks we do need to do that and for our own sanity our own mental health um, we do need to do that but what we consume in those moments and what we choose to do in that space is very important if it's you know uh, know what you're looking for if you're looking just for you know mind numbing show where you can switch your mind off know that's your objective and what you kind of need and go and find a show that can add that value to your life if you're looking for something to be moved kind of go and look for something that can move you entertain you or if you're looking for something to engage your mind into new ideas, a documentary or something different, you know, kind of know what you're searching for in sort of the space um, and get into to, to that sort of space. The last thing is um, that I'll talk to is the concept of um, representation. And this is something that's um, very close to me uh, and to my heart. And it's kind of sort of where I, my journey started off um, in terms of representation when I was sort of in high school towards um, when I was my final year of high school, it was the year 9-11 happened. And I remember sitting at home watching the news and seeing everyone talking about Muslims and specifically 
um, brown Muslims um, in a specific way. And I felt very frustrated as why are people talking on my behalf who have no idea or understanding about my identity, or about my culture, or about my religion? Um, why can't I have my own voice? Why can't I tell my own stories? Um, why can't I have a seat at that table? And that kind of got me onto this journey that got me into sort of the media space, um, sort of trying to find ways to enable within this. Um, you look at shows like um, Black Panther and what it's done for the African-American community in terms of seeing a hero that looks like the African-American community for the first time in a big budget production and how that's largely shaped that um, sort of being a very empowering moment um, for the, the community in that sort of space. Um, and then a show like Ertural, um that we produced. And, um, you know, to date, it's probably, I guess, I haven't looked at the latest numbers, but probably over two and a half billion views on YouTube alone, um, just about watched everywhere in the world. Um, and what we've seen is that people are just very moved by the story because it's the first time where you've seen the hero who is also praying Salah, who is guided by um, a spiritual leader um, who will give him, you know, prayers from the Quran give him guidance from sort of his history and his identity to help him kind of navigate life and get through problems, which we don't have never seen before in a big budget production. And the fact that people are able to see that for the first time and able to see themselves in that hero figure for the first time is something that people have been able to resonate with. It's something that's been able to move people around the world, um, which is incredibly powerful, incredibly moving. And, you know, we just have, that's the one show that we have, and I'd like to see much more coming out of this. And I'd like to see much more come into this. Um, it's and when we talk about representation, I mean, one of the challenges that we have, and I'm going to do a bit of an experiment here, so feel free to comment. Um, I'm going to ask some questions. You can comment here if you're on Facebook, um, either one. Um, but if you can just tell me what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say the name of the cities, all right? So the first thing that comes to your mind when I say New York. Anyone, you can just type it in the chat box. Buildings, Times Square, skyscrapers, buildings, Statue of Liberty, Apple. All right, when I say Paris, booze, that's interesting, diversity, all right. Eiffel Tower, Eiffel Tower, Eiffel. Blue, Eiffel, all right. When I say Baghdad, Okay, so car bombs, house of wisdom, it's interesting. I guess this is the shirt crowd, the scientists. So, I mean, it's definitely gonna be there. Um, or if I say Iran, or Iran, when you say Mahdi Sen, when you think of uh, Baghdad. But I guess, I mean, you get the idea of what I'm going with here, that when we talk about certain, the first association that we have, when we talk about some of these cities, is towards um, big buildings, because that's what we see in the media. When we're watching our sitcoms and we're watching movies, we see New York in this life, and we see in the Eiffel Tower, we see a specific way that is being portrayed to us, you know, year after year after year. Baghdad, primarily in our notion of Iraq, um, the way it's been portrayed to us in the media over time has always been towards bombs, and that's the, the headlines that we continuously seen that we forget about. You know, some of you mentioned the scientists or the House of Wisdom, um, and sort of the deep history that comes from this part of the world. And you can, you can go through sort of every country, and this thought experiment is there, and this is I mean, the, the interesting thing is this is also the shirt crowd, right? Um, who we are much more engaged from the East, like the name is that. Um, but even our own perceptions sometimes are there. And there's um, an author, his name is uh, philosopher, Elaine de Baton. He wrote a book called The News. Um, I speak about this in referencing quite often and my wife has told me I need to get new references. Um, but this is something that um, uh, it's resonated really deeply with me because in his talk, he touches on the fact that because the steady state has been presented in a specific way continuously through media. So the steady state of New York is always calm or the big cities or the taxi cabs or friends, the TV show, whatever it is that we've watched. Whenever there's something that's different to the norm, that's where we, re we are more reactive to that, which is why when there's an attack in New York, you see the world acting in a certain way. Same thing in France, when something happens, it's different to the norm and we can see what's happening currently with headlines, that's different to the norm that's presented to us. There's a much bigger reaction to when something would happen in Baghdad or 
um, Afghanistan or even if you're going into different Eastern countries because the norm that's presented of this within specific um, in entertainment media largely is always the negative towards this part of the world. So when something happens that's bad, there is no big reaction because it's expected. Um, you know, and that's the challenge that we have when it comes to representation. So how can we actually start telling more positive stories going through our history, reclaiming our history, reclaiming our narrative, that we can start owning that from different parts of the world and start changing the perception that people, um, and including ourselves, have in this sort of space. Um, and that's really where it needs to start. That's really sort of the deep work that needs to happen. And it's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen now. It's not going to happen in a year, two, three years. But it's a space where we all need to be getting involved in. And um, the biggest challenge that we have is, you know, it's within the entertainment media side, obviously access to funding is a challenge. Um, but we also don't have the skills to be, you know, do we have enough people writing scripts? Do we have enough directors? Do we have enough actors who can kind of fill within the space? Um, we don't necessarily always engage within the arts. Um, and this, I mean, my, my, uh, my view on this has largely changed sort of in the last two years. It was always, you know, news, politics, activism, that's kind of where we need to be. Um, and the arts is something that really starts telling our story. And beyond just filmmaking, getting into poetry, getting into music, getting into a way in which we can start em embodying ourselves, our character, our identity, that's what people are able to connect to. That's the deeper change. That's the deeper connections that we can start building. Because news tells you what's happening right here, right now. And we tend to connect just on those ideas that is very disempowering. But if we start connecting along more of a sort of identity space within um, deeper forms of media, you can see those bonds can last much further, those conversations can go much further, and we can start developing sort of a, a collective identity and a collective nuance and a collective conversation that can help us kind of shape things as you want to move forward. So just to conclude before we get to sort of the conversation point, um, because I think time is almost up here, um, you know, why? Um, and I asked uh, Michael and Talal just before this, do they want me to be more optimistic or pessimistic in sort of how to frame this year? And they said I should just be authentically me. And I am generally always, I guess, optimistic for those of people who know me in real life always tell me that. Um, and I am very optimistic about the future um, if we get it right. So when we say why um, and why now and why we want to shape the future coming back to the topic, it's the future is now, the future is here, the future is happening right now, because everything that we're doing, everything that we're shaping, all the policies about how these platforms need to be written, how they need to be governed, um, AI, you know, AI gets smarter by the amount of input that we put into it. You know, someone living in the dub in a refugee camp may not be putting necessarily input into AI systems that are going to help shape the future that we're heading to. What sort of um, data points are we contributing back into this connected world? How are we engaging into this connected world? How are we being present digital citizens within this and responsible citizens within this space? And how are we going to shape the future? Because if we don't show up now, and you know, a lot of the time, um, a lot of the work, I've had a lot of debates, um, and even when we're doing AJ Plus, where we need to do this, and people will argue, but where's the white paper? You know, we need to look at the data points. We need to kind of figure this out. And until we have that white paper or those data points, or what sort of case studies can we look at that will help validate this here? By the time you wait for all of that to happen, the future's already been shaped by someone else. And this is where I feel we lack in immensely right now, is that where we need to go to doesn't exist yet. And we have such an amazing opportunity to shape this future. Yes, there are challenges. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there are many, many things that are out there. But these platforms and the digital space that we exist in gives us all an opportunity to have a voice, to have a seat at the table, and to help direct where it's going to be. And what's going to happen in the next two to three years in terms of how all of this is going to be shaped is going to shape our future for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the line. And we don't need to do this now for us. You do this for your kids or your grandkids. You don't expect to see these results right now. But until we're able to show up and have a clear vision um, or at least a clear conversation about the vision of where we need to head to what the world should be, presence in today and understanding that the future is now, the future is here, and we all have a role to play in shaping that, um, I really truly hope that, you know, through initiatives like the SERP D1 and the SERP Leadership Program um, and many other initiatives that are out there, we're able to start having these conversations now. We're able to start having this and we're able to show up um, to break through those echo chambers, to combat information overload and to bring representation to the table so that we are able to shape the future as we kind of um, head down this, this path of um, an uncertainty or, you know, 
um, uncertainty is probably the best word, but you know, in every uncertain space that's out there, there is so much opportunity also, opportunity for growth, opportunity for development and opportunity for change. And hopefully we can all be those agents for change as we head into this, this new space. So with that, I will hand it back to Michael and I'd love to have a conversation and hear your insights. Please feel free to tell me I'm talking nonsense and that this is the most evil thing in the world or, you know, um, as I said, I don't have all the answers. I have a lot of questions about this um, and the space and it's continuously evolving and I hope collectively we can kind of come up towards um, something of benefit. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Riyadh, for that uh, engaging discussion. Uh, just before we get going, again, uh, for those of you who do have any questions or interventions, uh, and I would encourage you to do so, especially on this topic, uh, feel free to either write it in text format and we'll, we'll pass the questions along, or even better, use the raise hand function on the application uh, so that you can directly ask your question or engage in the discussion uh, yourself. So I'd really encourage you to, to do that. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of start us off. I want to pick up a little bit on uh, one of the last points you were talking about, essentially on, on cultural production and how for a long time there's been a focus on, on news, activism, politics, which of course have their place. Uh, but there's this sort of deeper idea of, of producing culture. And, and some of my thoughts and some of my observations that I have sort of notice of, of looking at that space with, with some few exceptions, and, and I think those are growing, but this idea of almost uh, mimicry of, of, of dominant forms of cultural production. So something is developed in, in Hollywood or in Europe or something, and there's a tendency uh, within, uh, within much of the Muslim world, let's say, and elsewhere to sort of essentially take those forms, take those ideas, uh, and sort of add maybe a superficial contour to them uh, to make them more uh, culturally friendly, more Islamic, as we, we, you know, kind of often come across. I wonder if you can kind of expand on this idea of, of cultural mimicry in that sense and how uh, the region in particular uh, can move beyond that, what skill sets are lacking and, and what we could do to sort of move towards a place where, as you were saying, there is there's indigenous cultural production uh, that's unique, that's tied into the history and culture in a very sort of deep and, and non-superficial way. So in terms of cultural mimicry, and I think, you know, when you mentioned what, uh, how people try to make it Islamic, I think one of the beautiful things about our religion is that, you know, it spans multiple cultures, right? So, you know, there is a space for that. And then you look at within productions, uh, you know, The Office, the show, for example, it's based off the UK version of The Office. A lot of people might like that, but the US version has done phenomenally well in sort of a space, which is really just taking um, the same format and applying it elsewhere. Um, you have a lot of reality shows um, that have taken sort of a templated format that's able to connect with people, but then they've kind of adapted it to different parts of the world. And it has kind of worked within a specific space. So I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong in that. It's more about the substance of what you're gonna kind of put into that and how you would make it your own. So, you know, um, the, the office as an example, um, in the US sort of the casting that they had in that brought a very unique element to it that made it authentically American compared to the UK version. So how do you kind of, the form is there, but how do you make it very relevant to sort of you and your identity and your space? Um, I think that's important in one part. Um, but again, that is still um, fits for and is sort of a Western perspective that might work well. In terms of um, different parts of the world, like I can tell you the um, Turkish drama series, it's the most watched foreign language series in the world after English globally. Um, has a very big audience uh, across Latin America and everywhere else. Korean drama series, also a very big sort of space. Bollywood movies have their own sort of, so um, within these different spaces, they all have their own flavor that they bring to the table. Um, and we are seeing people resonate with that. I think one of the great things we have within this technology space is that you are able to get your content out to a much wider audience than you ever did before. So, you know, platforms like Netflix licensing more content, uh, making it more available and introducing it in new parts of the world um, to an extent. I think there's, I mean, Netflix has challenges obviously in how they curate content and how they kind of want to do that, but there are other platforms emerging that are able to kind of connect and translate to different spaces. I think there's also an education space for us to maybe also understand how media is produced differently. Um, you know, one of the big questions we get is, um, you know, Eternal season one is like 76 episodes. Sounds like 
how on earth is it 76 episodes? Um, but culturally in Turkey, um, prime time is two and a half hours each night, right? Um, that is it. And you have to produce a show to fit that prime time slot. So the versions that you've seen internationally are at the moment cut up versions of the Turkish version of the show. Um, but culturally that works within the sort of space and even the way it's produced, a lot of the, the show is actually shot in the same week. It's not pre-production, like it's produced the season ahead and then it's just sort of released once everything's shot the entire season. Um, each episode is sort of shot within the week, edited and broadcast. It's almost like doing a movie a week that's kind of been released. Um, but what we've seen is that that doesn't always, like it's fine for show one big series like Ed Rule, but we do a lot of other shows and that same format may not work everywhere else in the world. So how can we kind of go back and maybe rethink our formats, rethink scripting, rethink sort of um, re-editing of shows and how do we kind of then position that in terms of series and how do we release it? It's something that we're still learning. Um, and we've seen that different parts of the world are reacting very differently. I don't have the answer to that because as I said what we may do again, in sort of a Turkish audience space may work in Latin America because it's a similar overlap with the telenovela um, sort of audience or sort of within a Bollywood space, which are used to longer form content and you know a lot of scenes of people riding horses. Um, people are used to that in certain parts of the world. But if we go in, into Europe or into sort of Western countries, um, people want more concise um, storytelling. So how do we kind of find that sweet spot between that? Um, that's something we're trying to figure out. And I don't think anyone has that answer yet. Um, but I mean, if anyone does have ideas around that, I'd love to hear them. Um, but that's kind of at least in terms of authentically in, in that sort of space. Um, the other thing is casting and language. I think language is very important in terms of how we actually um, stay true to our culture. Um, I know a lot of people have learned Turkish um, through watching the shows. Um, it's opened up to tourism, cultural diversity, people take in a much bigger interest within um, different countries through that. Um, dubbing is very important um, to some audiences, um, but and dubbing appeals to a specific sort of demographic. But what we're finding is what we're trying to do even was sort of when we're dubbing into Arabic or dubbing it into English or different languages, we're trying to keep some words in Turkish like um, Avala, for example. So can we kind of create these sort, sort of um, subtle cultural identity things that are unique to Turkey um, that are here so we can kind of introduce it into that show so people can relate to different cultures. Um, so we're trying to kind of keep some subtleties within the sort of cultural understanding um, so we don't fully lose that identity as we kind of try to appeal to different audiences. you are on mute, I can't hear you. Mute myself, there we go. Sorry, we have a question uh, from, from Abida. Uh, so you spoke about the negative effects or some of the negative effects of information consumption uh, in the digital age. Uh, how does your acknowledgement of these issues affect how you carry out your role uh, in, in digital strategy for, for our TRT? Uh, and are there certain tactics that you would want to uh, specifically avoid, for example? It's a very good question. Um, so, I mean, as much as I, I mean, I, I have a lot of concerns and I've always had concerns about the space. So for me, it's very much about being sort of value aligned, um, sort of the, the roles, positions, projects that I've chosen to work on um, have aligned more with my values and my perspective that I feel that if this is something that's going to add value to society and add value to humanity, those are projects that I would be willing to be part of and want to work in. And so specifically within TRT, um, the choice to move to Turkey was more around sort of the value alignment in terms of creating an alternate source from this part of the world that's able to draw on family values, um, not entertainment for the sake of entertainment, but entertainment that can actually inform, educate, um, and inspire you to be a better person, inspire you to good, to be inspired to um, different spaces. So having that alignment in terms of my personal values within the actual output that we do is very important to me in that sort of space and to keep it focused. Um, I think also continuously checking ourselves and when, I mean, the entertainment space is much easier, but within the new space that is the digital strategist, um, you constantly, your, your work and your career is built off disasters around the world. Um, so, you know, the more people that are watching your content, you feel great, but they're watching content about a disaster that's happening that's out there. And I think there's to be a continuous check that comes into that space where you take a, you always take a break, take a breath and kind of have to recheck yourself 
realign yourself and say, okay, why am I here? Why am I doing this? It's not just about the clicks. It's not just about the views that I'm getting. It's about the actual impact and am I actually conveying the story? And it's very important, I think, for anyone working within a digital strategist role within a digital um, space to continuously keep those checks and balances, to continuously keep yourself um, informed and keep yourself in check because it's easy to get carried away with things. Um, certain tactics that I may avoid, um, I said, for example, for me, on um, WhatsApp, for example, I, don't, I generally don't engage much within groups. I have specific um, ways in which I find that I need to engage on WhatsApp. I don't respond immediately to most things, which I think um, Talal from Shirk figured out um, last week. But I mean, I take the, the specific time and space to be able to do that. Sometimes I do get caught up within that. Um, on Instagram, I actually don't follow um, many accounts. I follow four accounts on Instagram because I'm not looking to use Instagram really to have overload. It's more just for my own information space. Uh, similarly on TikTok, I'm, I'm on TikTok, but it's more to understand the platform. So within my space, I actually don't use um, digital media as much as sort of an end user, I use it more sort of within a workspace um, uh, to kind of, I, or not necessarily a workspace, but an interest space. Um, I'm, as I said, but I'm also fortunate uh, that I have to be in a space where my values align with my work that I'm able to put that output in, which makes it easier for me within the space. Um, if I was in a different industry and working in a different space, um, th these questions would be much more difficult for me to answer. Khaled, I'm going to pass it over to Khaled now. He has an intervention. So, uh, Khaled. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Thank you, Riyadh, for your talk. Um, the, the topic that you're talking about really touches um, basically everything I have been doing um, for a very long time. <clears throat> but when it comes to representation, I feel that we are to blame um, for the idea of not increasing or enriching the content that really shows the essence of Baghdad, for example, or the Islamic world. Uh, I did my bachelor's research on representation of Islam in Western media, and I get the concept that you're talking about completely. However, I feel that for years, we have been pushing down, for example, independent filmmakers by either lack of funding or prosecution by our own governments. Um, from your place in TRT, Ashraf, for example, other organizations, why haven't we till now attempted to make our own Hollywood, Bollywood, or Nollywood to answer to, to this issue in particular? So, I mean, it's an excellent point, and I think that is the biggest challenge that we have. Um, you know, even just talk, for me, just having conversations with um, different production companies recently, funding has been a challenge, and to a large extent, funding in different parts of the region comes with a lot of strings attached to it also, um, which is a challenge. I think one of the other challenges that we have is that um, as artists and people who produce content, we like to be always true to the form of art. So yes, we may produce, but we produce more for art house uh, or film houses, um, sort of so very niche audiences that can't necessarily break into a more broader mainstream sort of space because we want to stay true to the art and stay true to the story. So we'll do the international film circuit and we'll see things within, you know, the Doha Film Institute has a lot of great movies that they kind of put out there, but it's very sort of niche spaces. And I think there's an element where we need to also understand and coming back to sort of Michael's point earlier about mimicking stuff that's out there, I think there's an element where we also need to see what's happening out there, see what people are doing and how can we maybe borrow from the industry of what's able to break out of our own echo chamber that can appeal to a more wider audience. Um, and I can tell you platforms like Amazon Prime or Netflix who are looking to fund productions are looking for something that can translate towards a much wider audience and not just necessarily a specific niche. So I think there's a, a mental jump that I think we need to do that is not just about us. We are global citizens. Our content should not just be for us. Um, we should be telling our story to the rest of the world. It shouldn't be our story just for ourselves. And I think that's an important differentiator in terms of how we go into the space. It is a challenge. Um, and I think at TRT, um, you know, we've seen that as a very big sort of challenge that exists in the industry. And we now are kind of starting to look into it a bit more to see how we can actually add more of the content that we produce into the space, but not just from our side, can we kind of encourage others and create an industry within spaces where people can start producing their own content wherever they are in the world. Um, and also the, the distribution side becomes more complicated 
um, monetization becomes more complicated because it costs a lot to produce a drama series or even a film. Um, are you able to get funding back if you put it on YouTube? Great, you may get the views, but it's not going to cover your um, the cost of production. So we need to kind of find this hybrid space to be able to get enough funding to get something out there. Um, and the last thing is also sometimes I think we're always looking for funding for the big idea and we want to, you know, give us a million dollars and we could produce this amazing thing. Um, but sometimes maybe we should just start small, you know, produce the pilot. Um, crowdfunding is an amazing space that's out there right now and if you can't get in the funding anywhere else, you know, come up with an idea, crowdfund for the pilot, do a 10 minute pilot, for example, put the idea out there. If people resonate with it, they will contribute to it and that you can kind of get your fund into that sort of space to produce what you want to produce. Um, but crowdfunding is something that up until now, I think largely within the Muslim world, um, Eastern world, we use it mostly for disaster response and fundraising um, for NGOs because we have so much going on, but we haven't really tapped into the crowdfunding space for innovation, for growth and for new ideas. And I think that's definitely something for us to potentially tap into to kind of explore these new ideas, test the concept so we can take it to market. Thank you, Riyad. Uh, we have an intervention from Rawan here. Uh, so Rawan is bringing up this, uh, this, this dilemma around the debate of, of whether the medium can actually be separated from, from the message. Uh, she brings up the point that it's sort of related to what we've been talking about in terms of the potential products that, that you get on the, out, on the sort of the output end is that uh, they become accessorized, whether it's uh, Islamic banking, Islamic fashion, not, not related only exclusively to the, the term Islamic, of course, but to all other ones. Uh, how do we navigate uh, uh, this dilemma? And you've spoken to a little bit about this in terms of uh, shifting our thinking towards more of a global thinking outside of our own echo chambers. But I'm wondering if you can, can just expand on this, this dilemma a little bit and how do we maybe not avoid the dilemma because it's there, but how do we, how do we navigate it? So I'm always hesitant with um, putting the word Islamic um, in front of anything that we're doing, because for me, um, we have our values are universal, right? So as Muslims, as believers, what we believe is something that everybody can relate to in the world, be it from our, a form of justice, understanding, even financial systems. We're going through very big challenges at the moment, and I think we do have solutions that can be offered to the world, not just for the Muslim world. And I think, I mean, the challenge that we do have at the moment is how do you kind of get that conversation going, get into that sort of space, and how do you present your idea um, while staying true to your values, staying true to the sort of space, but you present that idea towards a global audience. Um, so I think, you know, that there's actually two parts to this. One is I do think within the Muslim world, we do need some part of stuff that exists so that we can have those connections and kind of um, help sort of within the space. And there is a very big part of the Muslim world that likes word Islamic attached to it. Um, often we, as it within Muslim echo chambers, I can tell you off the show of Ertaru right now, when you go into certain parts of the world, um, people love the fact that, or they'll say this is an Islamic show, but you go to someone in Latin America watching it and they actually don't see it as an Islamic show. They see it as a show that's about justice and about you know fighting against the oppressor. So the same shows relating to people differently in sort of how they're attaching those labels to it. So from our perspective, it's not necessarily about attaching that label. It's about attaching the value to it how people attach their own labels to it, that's up to them. And how people are able to resonate with it, they see this and this is Islamic and this is, like, I can identify with this, great, that's your label, you want to go with it, good luck to you. We're not going to stop you with that, but we're not necessarily going to push that. If someone else has seen something out of that, um, that they can relate to whatever label they need to attach to it, let them attach it to that. So I think that we, as creators of these spaces, I don't think we should be attaching those labels early on. You should be true to your values, true to sort of how you position in this and let that shine through and let others attach those labels as they kind of want to go through that journey. Great. Um, I guess just finally on this sort of this point before we, we move on to a, a, another sort of issue. Uh, and this, this is a question coming from uh, Dilruba. Um, the issue of, of creating our own, let's say Hollywood, Bollywood, whatever you want to call it, uh, and the, the challenges that relate to this. How do you think that the, the maybe lack of, of sustainable systems or institutions uh, within these countries con contributes towards that? And, and what are some of these steps that we can take so that down the road, potentially there are those systems, whether it's uh, 
training for, for artists or filmmakers and in educational institutions, you know, funding centers, et cetera, et cetera. I know you, you deal with many of these challenges. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you can share your insights a little bit into uh, how this impacts the ability to, to create cultural productions and, and what are some potential solutions to that? So, you know, Hollywood and Bollywood didn't become Hollywood and Bollywood overnight, right? It started somewhere, it started small, and over time it's grown to become this big global industry that exists, um, that's out there. And I think when we benchmark in ourselves and we look in, sometimes you see Goliath over there and you think, oh my, how are we going to take this on? How is, does this exist? But this is decades, decades of sort of funding and industry knowledge that's kind of existed that's out there. Um, so we're not going to get there tomorrow. And I think we need to be realistic about that. But we should start on the journey with a longer term vision of, you know, in the next four or five years, we're going to kind of get into that space. Um, as I said, for me, it's to get this sustainable ecosystem starts with a lot of, you know, skill set development. It's not just about funding. Um, I, we do have producers, but do we have enough actors with sort of the skill set that's out there? Um, crossing cultures, languages, um, screen product, uh, production, post-production. There's many different people that go into sort of a production space. Do we have enough skills within the space right now to scale this? Because we might have, you know, four or five sort of spaces that are out there. But do we really have the ability to scale this to a new level? And you know, one of the examples, not um, specifically around drama shows, but if you look even at the Islamic sort of music space or in the sheet space, if you were to talk about the big artists that are out there, um, you know, if I can ask anyone in terms of English um, Nasheed artists or Islamic artists to name them, um, what's you probably come up with Mahar Zain, Sami Yusuf, Yusuf Islam, um, Zain Bika from South Africa, Dawood Wansby. And then, you know, maybe just a couple of other smaller ones that you can talk about, but there's not really many that, I mean, we are a community of over a billion people around the world, right? But we can probably on one hand count the creators and artists that are out there. Um, looking within even sort of an acting space, if you count actors who are actually representing the space, you could again probably count them all on, you know, one hand. Um, so, we do have a challenge in terms of how do we actually show up and again because there's not enough experience in the space right now and enough skill set it's not going to happen overnight so for me it starts with training it starts with encouraging um, people to go and study in this field um, if you see someone again if crowdfunding um, spaces that are out there um, support people in arts start bursary sort of spaces that can get into that sort of space um, let's encourage people to get those skills not just for the end production but let's invest in the skill making we can get to the funding once we have the skills but let's invest in actually developing those skills early on. Um, and from our side, I mean, I think at some point, I know our, our training center um, kind of does a lot of that sort of work and sort of training, but I think that's this, it's, it's an entire um, challenge that we have from this part of the world that we need to get into. On the funding side, funding is much, as I said, crowdfunding, we really, really not explore that. And when I talk about, you know, even this connected world, What's amazing about it is we can easily connect around ideas. We can easily connect and get training like we have in this conversation on Zoom right now. And with the um, coronavirus around the world, most universities and schools are closed and we've seen that you can actually learn stuff while sitting at home um, and you can crowdfund. So the barriers to entry are much lower now than they were before. So the, we don't need to get on a plane and fly to LA all of a sudden to go and learn the skills, but you can sign up to a class right now, um, go on to, you know, there's many cool platforms that are out there. Um, masterclass and you can learn how to produce music like Hans Zimmer from Hans Zimmer, for example, right? So go do a short course in that and kind of expand our ideas and kind of get out there and let's connect with those. And that's the power of this connected world and the digital world. So let's empower, upskill ourselves first, test it out of crowdfunding. The funding can exist through crowdfunding and there are people looking to fund this. And once you've demonstrated the concept of crowdfunding, take that to your Netflix or take that to your bigger production companies or bigger people who are funding it, say, we have the skill set. here's a prototype, we've done the pilot, 10 million people have watched the show, there's a demand for it. Are you willing to fund a series of this? You know, that's kind of build that whole ecosystem and kind of get into that space. And it, that does exist today. And if you're able to put in the time and effort, I think within the next few years, we can kind of create those alternatives to Hollywood and Bollywood. So I wanna just shift gears a little bit back to uh, social media in, the, in particular, uh, uh, and particularly, you know, in the context of you know, upcoming US elections, but of course, all these other issues uh, that, that you know, are around. The idea of, let's say, for lack of a better term, information warfare, uh, troll armies, these types of things, shaping the discourse, uh, creating specific echo chambers within social media platforms. 
uh, and of course challenging this notion that, as you mentioned in your, in your talk, may have existed in the, the earlier days of these platforms of, you know, they're, that they're somehow democratizing spaces, et cetera, et cetera. Now that we've seen, you know, particularly post 2011, uh, is that uh, states in particular have caught on to the game, uh, so to speak, uh, and have, uh, you know, poured a significant amount of investment into shaping messages on social media. How is this something that we can, I guess, maintain positive engagement within these spaces while all of this, forget about the sort of the, the, the individual trolls on their own, but all this pressure, let's say, from states or specific interest groups who have uh, money and resources to sort of pour into, into particular, shaping particular messages and discourses. How do we, uh, as, as users, as individual users of these platforms, continue to engage positively and effectively within this while you know, all of this is happening? By not getting angry and putting caps lock on and going and, you know, telling it people online. I think, um, you know, it starts with fact checking, I think. So I think, um, you know, it's these troll armies are, exist to push an agenda, push a specific topic and to get people upset. One of the most painful things for me is when these troll armies do get activated, everyone responding to the troll army actually makes it much worse than the actual troll army. The troll armies are very crafted messages. It's duplicated. You'll see some variations that are out there, but largely it's crafted from, um, someone who specializes in communications and it's well worded enough to seem as an authentic sort of space. When everyone else jumps into counter that, it's not. Um, it is really just descends into a screaming shout and match about, oh, you an idiot, you don't know this, what are you talking about? And a lot of swearing that goes into that space. And I think for us to be more responsible, that to understand, okay, this is sort of what's happening in that space and engage with it within a more constructive dialogue um, and looking to engage with the topic. Like a troll, exists, you're not necessarily going to change the troll's mind, right? But the people reading the comments and reading that conversation might be impacted by it because not everyone is engaging. So as you're engaging with these troll armies or engaging with stuff that's out there, understand that there's an audience that's reading what you're saying and understand what you're writing may be directed more towards that audience of who's going to read it, not the person who you're responding to. And I think if maybe we're able to do that, you can actually start having a much bigger impact. Um, fact checking, as I said, is important, like actually verify if you're able to credibly prove that this actually doesn't make sense for these reasons, then that's, you know, can go much further than just an angry response that you're going to type up there or even just blocking someone because you disagree with them. Um, so fact checking, I think is important, uh, responsible and understand that there's other people reading the conversation and direct your responses to the other people that's out there. Um, you know, and I mean, there's many things like, honestly, I don't think anyone knows where this is going to go. Are they going to put more restrictions in space with advertising that comes from um, state actors or not? Um, how do you define a state actor? You know, that's another debate that's coming out there. If you take the, the FARA Act that the US has in terms of what they label as a foreign agent in terms of media, um, you will have, you know, Al Jazeera or AJ Plus is kind of been forced to do it. You had Russia Today, TRT were all like specific non-Western entities are forced to sign up, but then you have France 24, which is also funded by the French government or Deutsche Welle or BBC who aren't forced to sign up for the same sort of foreign agents act. So again, within the sort of space is a much bigger debate that need to happen in what exactly is defined as state actor versus non-state actor versus public actor versus what's in the public interest. Um, and these are conversations that we largely aren't part of right now. And that's why you know, in to sort of shape the future these are conversations that are happening right now and we need to be actively engaged in this actively sort of seeing these things that are happening, seeing these policies that have been written and advocating for whatever we can on this behalf so that we can see that actual change. So on, on that note, do you think that there still is a space within uh, various social media platforms uh, or maybe has there ever been a space within these social media platforms to, to actually engage in, uh, let's say public discussions uh, on, on issues that have complicated truths, whether it's about you know, social issues, politics, uh, religion, and, and have sort of a rational discourse about them. And I, I'm, I'm framing this in the context of uh, those who, who, who argued that with the development of the printing press, at least, uh, that these sorts of discussions became more accessible to a wider public, of course, but because it, they were in these sort of textual and article formats is that they were able to engage uh, you know, with very nuanced ideas, complicated ideas, explore these, uh, you know, these sort of very complicated truths. Is this something that 
maybe ever was possible on social media platforms or or is it still something that is is possible or is there a particular way to approach these things uh within social media as it increasingly becomes uh you know the main mode for for many of us to get news to engage in in these types of conversations so i mean it's a very i mean that needs a session in itself i guess to unpack that sort of conversation um but when we're talking about sort of so the printing press when the printing press first came out who were the people that were against it right it was people in public office and it was also people within the religious space at the time because they were scared about what access to information may do to people because no one was controlling that information anymore so they were actually very resistant to the printing press and this idea of mass printing information because information unfolded without context can shape public opinion and can change people so that was a lot of the discussions at the time and we've seen some of the discussions happening right now within the social media space so it's not largely different in that sort of way um i think social media in its earlier days was much better um because it was much smaller much more curated and you were able to have conversations at this point it's much bigger and much more crazy out there for lack of a better word i think the meaningful conversations are going to happen in closed groups it's going to happen in a facebook group that you choose to kind of join with people actively looking to engage it's going to happen in a whatsapp group that you may choose to uh, join and kind of get in or in sort of a private chat on twitter where a group may be created i think that's where the meaningful conversations will happen and should happen or on a zoom call like this here and you're going to be seeing a lot more sort of niche communities or interest based communities start emerging over time um you can see that within the media space already you've seen some of the more successful media companies are niche focused specific around a topic that's able to relate to people um it has its echo chamber challenges for sure but if you want to engage in meaningful conversation debate those uh, spaces will emerge and largely those spaces don't exist yet because they haven't been invented yet facebook is still relatively new right so one of the things that's interesting and it's an example as i um so it's about i guess 6 or 7 years ago I was at a conference at youtube and people were saying youtube is very problematic because it doesn't have good enough filters for kids kid watching content can end up seeing something completely inappropriate and it's a terrible thing that makes us out there youtube never paid much attention to it until one day the feature was built and was added to the platform and people were like why well, no one requested this feature why is it all of a sudden up the um, priority list and what they realized was the youtube engineers got married started having kids and they started viewing the platform through the lens of being a parent versus before they were just viewing it as and using it wasn't really important to them but then they realized well now my kids are going to be doing this i quickly need to kind of build this so these things are kind of emerging as we go in along and that's why they said that this future needs to be shaped as to um you know who remembers my space you know it was there didn't exist friends to high five you can go through a number of platforms that existed you know 5 10 years ago even before that that don't exist anymore today it's facebook you know tiktok is the thing this year tiktok didn't exist 2 years ago um so these platforms will continue to emerge there will be new platforms that will come up and if we seen there's a challenge that we're unable to have these conversations that's an opportunity for someone to go and build a new platform that can cater to these sort of things and i think every successful startup that's been built has identified a problem and how am i solving this problem and you start with that and i think this is the opportunity and through this pandemic and as we kind of get all the sort of digital natives um the platforms that we need to govern our society the platforms we need to govern ourselves the platforms we will need to communicate around deeper ideas and conversations just have not been built yet and it's a matter of time that will be there and we could be one of those anyone on this could be one of those started up or someone else will do it but that's the opportunity that does exist it's sort of how we want to shape that so this is from uh, ragad uh on this this idea of social media platform so uh is getting away from social media platforms and turning off the the noise so to speak uh a healthier option for our personal lives uh is this a choice that can also be taken collectively however on the flip side engaging in it to have collective impacts of any kind is of course uh work that that can't be escaped the question is is there any way to separate our personal preferences for uh, a healthier life in that sense uh while also being able to maintain representation and stay connected yes i think it is um so for, i mean for as at for myself i i very curated in deciding what i do and what i follow and how i engage within that space i actually use social media very little for personal um uh posts um with the exception of what with whatsapp or sort of close groups of people who know me personally that will have those conversations but in terms of my actual public usage it's very curated and designed for that and i think for us as users i think we should be as intentional about our usage of social media 
not just using it because everyone's using it. I think we should know what we're using it for, why we're engaging within that space and what we're looking to get out of that and working within that. And I think if we are more intentional about how we do that, opting in and opting out of spaces, that's important. And I think that all of us are able to do that. Um, it's easy to get caught up into the hype. It's easy to get caught up in the next big thing. I think there's an element, like I said, I use TikTok. I'm well over the TikTok average user group, but I use it just to be informed about what's happening on the platform and understanding it. Um, TikTok as a platform, for example, um, BTS, which is a Korean pop group, fans are very popular on there and they were responsible for the Trump rally com being completely booked out and no one attending a Trump rally and how a younger generation were able to use a platform through fandom and fan content to have an impact in the real world. So for me, I'm using the platform intentionally to kind of understand that and understand how those sort of things are working. Um, so intentionality, I think is very important. And I think if you're able to get that, identify why you're using this platform, what the objective is, um, that's important and you'll be able to, to manage your spaces much more effectively. And this is personal, this is for work. Um, you can kind of get into that space. So um, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll close with this. Uh, and it's on a related note is this you mentioned sort of intentionality and this and this uh, ability to 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 act or to to impact change. I'm wondering if you can just speak a little bit more to how we can translate, you know, all of the information that we are exposed to on social media into, I guess, actionable uh, into something that's actionable, whether it's on the activist politics front or even within the the, the cultural sphere. And, and what do you sort of see? You know, this is always the question which no one can ever really answer, but we always ask it is, how do you see that uh, developing uh, uh, in the future? So I think translating it into the real world, I think it's, it's up to every individual, right? So it, again, it depends what you're taking out of it. Um, so well, there's two parts. One is what we're taking out of it. So how are we, what are we consuming? And what you consume ultimately shapes you. It's the same as reading a book. You choose to read a book because you want to be informed about something. So you're opting to consume this here because it's going to shape your percep uh, perception on something. It's going to shape your mindset. It's going to shape your mood. It's going to shape kind of how you're feeling about something. So that has a direct impact on your day, how you're going to function. And you know, I've always said this, even um, when I was at Old Zero, wherever it is, when House of Cards um, came out on Netflix, immediately you could see people's tones and emails were changing. Um, in a work capacity, even a friend capacity, and people were kind of talking because everyone was watching the show and everyone's kind of seen all the subtleties and then they kind of picking up on those nuances and trying to see, oh, can they also convince someone of this? So you can actually see that impact in terms of what's sort of trending and how that's actually been applied to our life. So what we consume ultimately shapes our actual impact, whether we know it or not. And it's actually having a real world impact in that. So be very intentional about what we put in because that's ultimately going to reflect us. The second thing is about how we engage and how what we actually contribute to the system. And I think that comes back to sort of the earlier topic where I was saying about why we need to do this because engaging in these platforms helps shape the algorithms. It helps add more information to an audience that's consuming it out there. So when you're engaging and actually contributing, it's not just about consuming. The thing about these platforms is just as important to contribute as much as it is to consume. Be actively engaged and sometimes don't do it just for the likes. You, know, you may put something up there and it may get zero likes, um, but you know, you said something that's important, people would have read it. Um, and most of the time, I think if people disagree with you, they're not gonna like your post. They can either comment on it. If people agree with you, they'll probably share it without even reading it. So, you know, those sort of indicators that we look for for the endorphin kicks don't actually mean anything anymore. So engage with intentionality also, engage with the mission, engage with the purpose, understand I'm doing this here because I want to shape a conversation or I want to be part of this conversation. And I think that this voice is not being heard in this conversation or this perspective is not being heard. So here's an interesting article that I'm going to share so that there's a different view so we can either broaden our own mindset and when we engaging to also engage with an open mind. So to understand that, people who are posting other stuff that's out there, actually see what's shaping them because they've been shaped by the inputs that are coming in. So if someone shares a link that you disagree with, just don't tell them I'm not gonna click on the link because I hate this um, Fox News, or whatever it is. Look at it so you can actually understand what message is being crafted by Fox News. You can actually understand the psyche, understand what inputs are coming into that. So by kind of managing those two, you're able to kind of put that into your own space, which will translate into the real world. Um, and the last thing is, um, you know, put on your phone, go out, well, don't go out. Um, when Corona is over, um, or put on your phone and have a, a video call and a cup of tea with a friend of a video call. 
um, or someone you haven't connected with in a while and just have a conversation and just catch up on stuff and do that. I think we've forgotten how to do that or forgetting how to do that. And, you know, the sort of personal relationships, one-to-one -one conversations um, is something that's very important. Nurture those relationships, nurture those spaces where you can have open, frank conversations with people and don't be afraid to put your phone down. Don't be, I mean, you're not going to miss that WhatsApp message if you check it an hour later. The world's not going to end if you didn't check your Twitter feed or update your Instagram. It, the world definitely won't end if we forget to do that. Um, but we may come out as better people on the other side if we kind of take a break from it and just, you know, reconnect around things that truly matter. Thank you.